NVIDIA has completely abandoned its post. 229 days since last incident of a $200 card. AMD, meanwhile, has created an absolute cluster fire. NVIDIA and AMD have gotten incredibly greedy over the years, but they've cleverly disguised the reality by showing what appears to be a generational improvement that, as soon as the price is analyzed, begins to fall apart. We've taken the time to put numbers together to prove all of this. This is completely ignoring the current pricing and just looking at MSRP, which is what the companies intend to sell these cards for. Even just looking at MSRP, we've seen an increase in price with a decrease in relative performance improvement generationally. There's still an absolute performance uplift, and that's been enough to fool some customers into thinking that things are still advancing apace and that value is still there. It's just cleverly disguised. In the case of Nvidia, that's by moving the names up the stack so that it always looks like there's an improvement. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and the Silent Base 802 case. The Silent Base 802 got high accolades in our review for its high build quality and its versatility in both silence focused and airflow focused built. The 802 comes with swappable mesh panels or noise damped panels, so you have options for either approach. The Silent Base 802 case is able to fit larger builds as well without being overbearing, and it stands out for its mechanics quality and assembly quality. Learn more about Be Quiet's new case at the link in the description below. So this idea first came up when we were reviewing the RTX 3060 and also when we were working on the RX 6700 XT from AMD. The goal here is to demonstrate more clearly our point that there's been a stagnation in performance for the dollar. So in our reviews, we started to show this story where the performance technically is improving, yes, over the previous XX60 name or whatever the case may be for AMD and NVIDIA alike. But in reality, since those names are moving and ascending the stack and the hierarchy in price, uh, the performance improvement is, is disguised a little bit in the naming of the product. Ultimately, naming is mostly arbitrary. And what we need to do is sort of strip the names away from it and look at the price to the percentage improvement. So the percent increase in price and the percent increase in improvement and see if that has fallen out of line over the past year or two alone. Price has crept up over time for SKUs of certain product families especially. This northern migration has been most noticeable in the mid-range parts, with the 60 series being the easiest to highlight. To some extent, there's a valid statement in saying that this is just a name, and it is. As long as something still exists in the old price class, migrating a name up the stack doesn't actually tell us anything. The name is, of course, irrelevant to the product's performance or price, because it is only a name but it's important for other reasons. This is also more than just moving the name up the stack. The performance improvements have regressed with time as well, and in fact, we end up stagnant. Although there are absolute performance improvements generationally, the relative improvement has gone down, and therefore the value for the customer has gone down as well. Here's the release pricing of the XX60 series GPUs over the past few years from Nvidia, along with the release dates. The GTX 960 came out around $200, with the pricing in its final six months of availability at about $150. The release date was January of 2015. After that, we saw a 26% increase in launch price, moving to the GTX 1060 at $250 in July of 2016. In the last six months of its availability, it was about $173. The 3 GB GTX 1060 came out a month later at $200, maintaining the 960's launch price at 1 GB less VRAM. And the reason we're talking about the final six month pricing in here as well is because that's what customers remember when they're looking at an upgrade. So when the 1060 is out and it's been out and the 2060 is coming out, people when considering the new version, when doing comparisons, are going to look at what can I pay today for a 1060 that is old or at the end of its life, and what can I pay for this 2060 that's just come out? They're not looking at what could I have paid a year or a year and a half ago for a 1060, or should I get a 2060 today? Because that's not how reality works. In reality, people are, when they're buying, when they're looking at reviews, we are presenting our data to someone who doesn't yet own a card or who is considering an upgrade. And in the instance of someone who doesn't yet own a card, the original MSRP is totally irrelevant to the consideration. And that's a point we're trying to make in the RTX 3060 review. All of you are on board with it, uh, but we're trying to make it clear to Nvidia at this point as well. Next, the RTX 2060 launched at $350, a 40% climb from the $250 GTX 1060, or a 100% increase from the price of the GTX 1060 in its final few months of selling prior to the RTX 2060's launch. Now, because this is all mostly the name, 
we need to look at performance, and we'll do that next. The RTX 3060, though, launched at $330, which is technically a 5.7% reduction in price from the RTX 2060's launch price, except that the RTX 2060 was available for $285 to $300 in its final six months of availability, and that includes a relaunch of the RTX 2080 die that was cut down to a 2060, offering accidentally increased performance in some applications. It still felt like an increase for these reasons, despite technically a move down in MSRP. For any of this to matter, we need to look at performance. And so what we did was we took our benchmarks over the years, and we took the average FPS number primarily, and sort of created an aggregate of the performance of all the different cards, created a score, and then we did a percent change from one generation to the next. And this table that's coming up is the one where it starts to fall apart for NVIDIA. And customers, again, you're not buying on MSRP, you're buying on what it costs, which now especially is different than MSRP. But uh, we're also talking about the normal market circumstances where the card is priced down at the end of its life. This really tells the whole story. The GTX 1060 offered a 70% uplift tested today versus the GTX 960. The RTX 2060 offered a 67% uplift over the 1060. So here we're pretty similar. The RTX 3060 offered an 18% uplift over the RTX 2060. That's a clear regression. But it's easy to overlook the fact that the 2060 to 1060 comparison is also unexciting, despite carrying the same uplift as the 1060 to 960. That's because of the price climb. The original GTX 1060 was 26% more expensive than the GTX 960 at launch, or 67% more expensive than the end-to-sale prices of the GTX 960. The GTX 1060 was at least equal in launch pricing when looking at the 3 gigabyte model from a month later anyway, and the limitations of the 3 gigabyte card we won't get into right now. Looking at the RTX 2060, that one was 40% more expensive in MSRP than the $250 GTX 1060 variant, yet it offered the same near 70% improvement that we saw in the 1060 to 960 comparison. The price versus the last official pricing of the 1060 was, again, double. A moment ago, we said that the same new to sale price delta was 67%, so we've climbed here as well. Now, with the RTX 3060, the pricing is about the same, or 16% increased over the last known sale price of the 2060, while offering just an 18% improvement in average gaming performance. So even ignoring the names of these devices as arbitrary in nature, the performance to price has slipped in a massive way. And that's exactly what we meant when we said there was market stagnation, because once you get down to a $1 per one percentage point improvement, it starts to become questionable how much the improvement is really worth in reality, especially when the MSRP of the card, again, ignoring the current conditions, has climbed anyway. So it's not like it's a drop in replacement, it's slotted higher. And by the way, there is no drop in replacement. There's nothing lower than the 3060 in the RTX 30 series. Now we'd like to do a $200 card comparison ignoring names, apropos nothing, because then it'd be the GTX 960, the GTX 1060, the GTX 1660, and the RTX something or whatever comes in the next series down in this price class. Unfortunately, though, NVIDIA has completely abandoned its post at this price point. The fabs are printing money faster than the actual money printers are right now. That's saying something. So the next thing we did instead, since we can't compare some current Gen $200 card to the rest, was take the time to map every card, NVIDIA and AMD. By the way, AMD, you're not getting away from me in this one. You're in here too. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD have released a lot of cards over the last decade or so. We went back to about 2010 for NVIDIA, about 2008 or 9 for AMD, and we checked how many days it took each company to launch a card for its new generation or its new naming scheme in each price class. So if the company launched with, say, a $500 card, we counted that as day zero, and then we counted from then till the launch of a $200 to $250 card, how many days was that? And from the original day zero to the launch of a 100-ish, $130 to $200 card, how long was that? And just to make something clear here, we don't count 199 as being below 200. We count that as 200. So uh, we always round MSRPs up to the price that they're basically priced at in this comparison. As expected, NVIDIA started each generation with an expensive card or two, a flagship. And we actually don't have a problem with this. It makes sense to start with your highest end product to set the stage and create a halo product, a marketing halo effect. 
Every launch had zero days until the $500 SKUs, meaning they launched with those expensive SKUs. Where it gets screwy is the $200 to $250 department, which is a little bit variable. You'll notice that the GTX 700 series only took 33 days to get from what started as a $650 card to a $200 to $250 card. And there was a 650 Ti boost that had come out late in the previous launch cycle as well. So that persisted as sort of the option in the sub $200 department for Nvidia. Part of this immediate launch of the uh, 33 days to get to a cheaper card on the 700 series might have been related to backlash from what started as a $650 GTX 780. It later did come down to $500 though. It then took 271 days to get to the GTX 750 and the 750 Ti at below 200 bucks. But again, the 650 Ti boost was in there carrying for a little bit. Those cards, interestingly, the 750 and the Ti were on Maxwell and they persisted as day one options with the GTX 900 series release. The GTX 900 series needed 126 days to get down to 200 to $250. After that, the RTX 20 series took only 53 days to get to the same price point, more similar to the GTX 700 series. It also needed 215 days to get to the GTX 1650, and this is more similar to the GTX 600's release pattern. Averaging the last decade, Nvidia has needed about 136 days to get to 200 to $250 or 175 days to get to sub $200. Then we get to the RTX 30 series. We're at 229 days and counting. 229 days since last incident of a $200 card or $150 card or really anything that's not 300 plus in MSRP. Nvidia was on this route before the cards were low availability to begin with. And now it just, we're not sure how much of it is continuing that trajectory where it just looks a little bit greedy and shuffling the price higher and higher for each generation, increasing the ASP each generation. Uh, and how much of it is them saying, you know what, everything's selling anyway. Uh, let's just let's just revel in this current market for a little bit. AMD, meanwhile, has created an absolute cluster of naming that's so twisted a contortionist would blush just to look at the Wikipedia page. We said earlier that naming is sort of arbitrary. It, it does actually matter though in terms of marketing and messaging to your customers. But even making the price to performance comparison is difficult when we try to ignore the names just because AMDs are all over the place. Here we've simplified some of the major devices from each generation with the architecture. The R9 285 and 285X were a new architecture than the higher end R9 290 and 290X, creating confusion, and also newer than the R9 390X, which was a refresh of the R9 290X. Then there's the R9 380, which is a refresh of the R9 285 and 285X, because that makes sense. Then the RX 480 was followed up by the RX 580, which is a refresh. And then the RX 590 followed that, which was a refresh of a refresh or a re-refresh, as we called it in our review. With all of these refreshes, it's a wonder that Coca-Cola hasn't sued AMD yet for trademark infringement. Looking at this table, it's clear why AMD struggled over the last decade, especially the, the earlier years in it, to consistently win hearts and charts with its GPUs. The company has shipped most of its refreshes and new architectures with day one availability of the 200 to $250 cards, which is why some of its customers have felt so burned in the recent generations and why it's struggling to pick up new customers. And the market share does in fact reinforce that statement. AMD has sent the signal that it's available in these price classes. And more still, it has done this with bombastic, tasteless ad campaigns that were poorly timed about how it's the underdog looking out for gamers. So when AMD is absent from the $200 price point, everybody notices. <laughs> but they also notice when it's absent from other price points because it can't choose which one it wants to be present in. In this table, you'll see several entries labeled 999. That means that a card never shipped in that class for that generation. The $400 plus cards were absent for years and then it flipped in the Vega generation. They launched immediately with no low end cards made available. The RX 500 series were just refreshes, but never got a replacement with Vega. And this table is complete chaos when you just sort of zoom out and look at the dates that are all over the map, giving us a better idea for why AMD has had such trouble over the years. So where for Nvidia, it's more of a sort of greed and gradual price creep thing. For AMD, it's an identity crisis. Who are you? What's the market for AMD? And these questions AMD has tried to answer, but it keeps changing. It's like every couple generations, they change their minds on what they're doing. We don't know who they are or what they're doing. For years, they've been 
trying to establish, for example, that they're in the, the pro affordable gamers market at $200 with the RX 580 being a whatever $200 card you can play VR games with when that was a big marketing point. Uh, but then that price class has been absent for a couple generations now. So it's not really 100% clear what AMD is trying to do with its life, uh, but we assume it's so, so, it has a plan, maybe. The biggest problem then with AMD's GPUs, it's not the same as NVIDIA's. AMD has been in second place in a race of two for a while now. But with the RX 6000 series, it finally broke through to a more directly contentious position with NVIDIA. That means that AMD hasn't had the market positioning to play the same pricing games as NVIDIA does, although it does play games. The company has slipped on driver delivery promises. It's had senior officials taking shots at NVIDIA on Twitter about supply, as if AMD would be immune to global, all-inclusive over-demand that's affecting nearly every single industry. And it's, it's affecting not just computers, but housing, cars, commercial real estate, bikes, kayaks, sportswear. Why AMD's team members ever thought they'd do better than literally the world is beyond us. And if we're being generous, it's delusional at best, but that's a different topic. We will, however, give AMD a lot of credit for finally shipping some GPUs in the 6000 series that really compete with NVIDIA. The 6800 XT was a fairly exciting launch for AMD. It's not at the same level in RTX performance, but it's killing it for rasterization performance with the 6800, the 60, uh, 800 XT, and to some extent the, the 6700 XT, although the pricing gets a bit wacky towards the lower end of AMD's scale right now. So AMD is sort of doing the right thing, unfortunately, because Nvidia is dragging the prices up, AMD is being dragged up with it. Because no, of course AMD is not going to undercut Nvidia by massive amounts when they only need to undercut them by a little bit. And right now, no one needs to undercut anyone, because what's the point of doing that uh, when you can just sell it for more because everyone's going to buy it anyway. But the MSRP point of it is that AMD gets dragged up the ranks with Nvidia. And so when one of them is in a position of power and does price creep, the other one will, by nature, also price creep, but not to the same percentage increase. The point, though, of all of this, other than a little bit of a rant about both of these companies, uh, is that they've both ditched the low end and abandoned post for a significant time in the market now. And the launch dates were much closer together for low-end devices in the past. They weren't always consistent, but they tended to be closer together. And NVIDIA especially has strayed from that. So we'd like to see this change. Uh, the companies are producing more GPUs than they've ever produced. You can look at their earnings. They're public companies. It's known. So the problem is that uh, obviously demand is super high. We've talked about this. but. Even still, we'd like to see some fab space allocated for these lower-end parts. And it's not like they need the same process. You've seen this with NVIDIA, where it's done 16 nanometers and 14 nanometers at the same time, or whatever, they might have been 16, 12, but at the same time, because they didn't need the best process for all of the GPUs. So it's the same thing here. It's not like necessarily the best seven or eight or whatever nanometer thing that they each want to use has to be available to make the low-end GPUs, they could do some scaling. And even still, by the way, even if you're on an architecture that is not something you could backport to something else, or you don't have some other architecture in the bag that you can pull out and throw out into production again, even in those circumstances, some of the supply can be allocated to these lower-end parts. But the reason they're not being allocated to lower-end parts right now is because why, as a public company with shareholders, would you do that when you can keep selling 3080s at full price, or whatever the, the GPU may be? because the reason to bring parts down the stack, it's not to help people necessarily, although uh, Jensen, from what we've heard, does care more about the gaming audience than perhaps it would seem normal for a CEO of a company so large. But bringing cards down the stack, it's not really just to help people, it's to sell things with a certain strategy. And right now, no normal st strategy applies. Anyway, some really interesting numbers. We were just kind of looking at the release timing, the, the days between certain launches and the pricing versus the performance improvement. Thought it was really interesting data. That's not just standard benchmark charts. Of course, you can find those in our reviews if you want them. So it's kind of interesting to look at. It was more of an academic exercise than anything else. And hopefully you found something interesting in there. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus for more content or some of our products. And uh, we'll see you all next time.